uh, Senator Hassan. Well, thank you very much. Just want to test that folks can hear me. They can. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and for our ranking member. I want to also thank all our witnesses for being here today. And I'd like to specifically acknowledge former CISA Director Chris Krebs. Director Krebs, I want to thank you for your work in standing up the agency as CISA's first director and in securing our elections. <clears throat> I remain deeply troubled by your abrupt and unjustified dismissal, which has made our country less safe. Now more than ever, the challenges of this pandemic and our nation's increased reliance on online services requires the experience and steady leadership that you have displayed. Even so, I want to express my deep thanks to you and to the men and women at CISA for the work that you have done and will continue to do to help make our country and our communities safer. Now, I have three questions for you, Director Krebs. Uh, let's start with this one. As the CISA director, you attempted to tackle disinformation campaigns via the rumor control effort by CISA. That's the name you all gave it. Rumor control is a resource featured on CISA's website to debunk common misinformation and disinformation narratives. So first, in your time as CISA director, were you ever asked by any administration official to refrain from debunking disinformation or misinformation? Yes, ma'am, thank you for the question. I was never directly approached on any rumor control changes or alterations. I understand my staff was. I told them that if anyone had any problems with what was on rumor control, I was the Senate confirmed leader of the agency. Ultimately, I approved content, and they would need to come talk to me about that. And I, I never got that phone call or visit. But you are saying that uh, staff did report to you that there was outreach from um, officials asking them to make changes? Yes, ma'am. Were you ever asked to take down an entry that debunked a conspiracy theory? N not directly, no, ma'am. Was your staff? They were asked about some of the content, and again, I reiterated and reinforced that I owned that content, and if anybody had an issue with it, they needed to come talk to me. Was it ever implied that your job was at stake if you didn't ease up on debunking disinformation? I certainly never interpreted any, any statements or anything along those lines, no ma'am. Well, I would like to uh, explore with you further, um, perhaps after this uh, uh, panel, uh, some of what you just said in, in terms of your staff, but I wanna move on to a couple of other things just in the interest of time. Director Krebs, given your experience with tackling disinformation, I want to talk about the post-election disinformation campaign that has been waged. The president and many others have tweeted outlandish claims of massive voter fraud and truly wild conspiracy theories. However, the president's lawyers won't or don't usually bring these same claims when they go into court. When they do, the judges, often conservative or Republican-appointed judges, have dismissed them. Director Krebs, given your experience with disinformation campaigns, why do you think there is such a gulf between rhetoric and reality? What's the goal of this disinformation campaign? Uh, I, I think generally that disinformation now, currently particularly domestically, is being used to create confusion and, and drive a certain narrative. But our, but our point with rumor control at CISA was about identifying, uh, you know, initially foreign uh, activities, uh, but it became more of a domestic or even uncertain uh, origin. And it was things, again, like hammer scorecards, some of these claims of malicious algorithms. And they were, they were pretty straightforward to debunk in the early days, but they continue to this day. There's confusion being sown about how uh, election machines are used, how they fit into the process. Even, even now in Michigan right now with Antrim County, there was a, uh, a forensics audit done on uh, some of the machines there. And there was a group that released a report and it's a 22-page report. I looked at it, and I've, others have looked at it. And, and to me, you know, it, it implies that those systems are compromised and not dependable, and you can't trust the votes and any other of the machines across the state. So I was a little concerned about that, but, and I looked at the report, and it claims that there was a 60% error rate 
in the machines, the elect election management systems. And so again, I dug into that and it, it makes the claim that then, you know, 68% of the votes cast uh, are therefore uh, not dependable. And, and I've seen those claims being repeated on social media, by the campaign, by the president. And so I wanted to understand what that was all about. So I looked at it and, and in fact, it, it was, it was not that there were 68% of the votes there were errors, it was that the election management system's logs had uh, recorded 68% of uh, some sort of the logs themselves had some sort of alert rate. And that is being used to spin the, the, the that machine is not trustworthy. But the problem is, is the, the report itself doesn't actually specify any of those errors, except for one. And it's on page 19, or actually it's on page 20. And it says, there is no permission to bracket zero bracket. And that is being claimed to mean that somebody tried to get in in the machine and wipe the records. And so I looked at that and I said, okay, I don't know if it actually says that. And something jumped out at me, having worked at Microsoft, um, that these are Windows-based machines. The election management system is a Windows-based machine. And the election management system is coded with a programming language called C Sharp. There is no permission to bracket zero bracket is a placeholder for a parameter. So it may be that it's just not good coding, but that certainly doesn't mean that somebody tried to get in there in zero. They misinterpreted the language in what they saw in, the, in, in their forensic audit. And that's just one example. They misinterpret, and Don Palmer, Commissioner Palmer, I'm sure can talk to us about whether there's a HAVA 90-day har safe harbor rule or which of the VVSGs is applicable to those machines and whether that machine. So I'm seeing these reports that are factually inaccurate continue to be promoted. That's what rumor control is all about. That's what I'm continuing to do today based on my experience and understanding and how these systems work. We have to stop this. It's undermining confidence in democracy. Well, I, and I thank you so much for that statement. Um, Mr. Chair, I'll note that a couple of other people have gone a little bit over their time, and I have one more question for Mr. Krebs. Sure, and ahead. with your indulgence, I'd like to ask it. Sure. Uh, Director Krebs, I thank you for that response. I think it's a very important example of um, the kind of disinformation and spinning that is happening uh, that frankly puts confidence at risk and puts some of our people at risk. Uh, you have noted in the past that we have a very diffuse election system that is administered at the local level. At individual polling locations, there are often numerous nonpartisan officials involved in administering a community's voting process. That diffusion of responsibility also makes it extremely unlikely that there would be a single point of failure or fraud that could sway an election. Director Krebs, you have worked with the numerous election officials across state and local governments. Can you speak to how the diffuse nature of our election systems affects the security of our elections? And just also in the interest of time, um, I want you to comment too, so, sadly, some of these nonpartisan officials at the local level have been subjected to harassment and even death threats. So can you speak to the impact of these threats? And do you think the president and his allies have done enough to condemn the threats of violence? I'm, I'm not aware of much in terms of condemning the threats of violence, um, having been a recipient of some of them. I, I think it's, uh, again, an affront to democracy that the, the citizens of the United States of America that are responsible for executing this sacred democratic institution of elections are being threatened on a daily basis. I mean, you, you, you name it, whether it's emails, whether it's phone calls, whether it's people showing up at your house, I, this just, I know this is not America I recognize, and it's got to stop. We need everyone across uh, uh, the, you know, the leadership ranks to stand up. I, I think I, you know, I would appreciate more support from my own party, Repu the Republican Party, to call this stuff out and end it. We got to move on. We have a president-elect in uh, President-elect Biden. We have to move on. These officials that are Republicans, look at Georgia, Brad Raffensperger, Gabriel Sterling, uh, Jeff Duncan, it, it, these are Republicans that are putting country over party. They're being subjected to just horrific threats as a result. This is not America. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Krebs. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair, for your indulgence. And Mr. Krebs, thank you for your patriotism. Thanks. Thanks, Senator Hassan. Uh,